Yes. Um, today we have Jinxing Wang to tell us about uh, computing min degree elimination ordering. Determinism, and then we can also do the decorrelation with the eternal randomness with its exponential decay to get our approximate mean degree algorithm. Okay, first we will talk about the field graph in the linear solver. So that as we know, uh, funny uh, linear, linear solver is a very hot topic these years, and so in this talk we're, we're going to focus on the precise solver for this linear system. So we just need to solve this linear system uh, AX equals B, where A is M M matrix, and we need to find the, a solution which is uh, a n-dimensional <coughs> vector X. And, and we assume A is symmetric, positive, definite matrix in this plot, <coughs> and then a very classic solution is called Gaussian elimination as we learned in high school. And, and so in this talk, we're going to talk about the graph uh, theoretic perspective of, of this Gaussian elimination process. So we can define the field graph G associated with this matrix A uh, in the following way. So assuming A is N by N matrix, so we're going to have N vertices and then for each non-zero entry ij in this matrix A, we are going to make an edge ij. So this is the example. So we have a matrix A here, and then we are going to build a field graph G in the following way. We just have, first of all, we, we have five vertices, and then for each non-zero entry here, we just make an edge. See, like in the first row, and the fourth coil will have a minus one, and it's non-zero. So we we make an edge between the first node and the fourth node. So it's very simple. Is that the correct graph for that matrix? Uh, yeah. So so this node is this is the first node, and this is the second. Uh, okay, I see. Because the symmetric. Yeah, this is the uh, symmetric. You have to definitely. divide by two the number of non zeros. I'm not counting the diagonal either. Uh, yeah, I'm not counting the diagonal. You, you can ignore the diagonal. Okay, uh, okay so, so as we know, a very fundamental step in Gaussian elimination is to zero out. Um, uh, <laughs> we need to pick an entry, and then we need to zero out all other entries in the same ordinary row, right? So this process is called pivot. Um, it has the same interpretation in this field web. Say we want to pivot the first entry in this matrix, which is four. So we know the first entry is, a, uh, the first row is associated with the first vertex in this graph. So what we need to do is simply to make a click out of uh, these Reynolds neighbors. So, uh, so in this talk, we assume there's no cancellations because cancellation can only make things better. So, we, so after zeroing out the first row and column, we, got, uh, we, we get the following matrix. 
and then uh, the result uh, field graph is just the graph over here. Uh, so first of all, we remove this node from the graph, and then we make the click out of its labor, neighbors. Okay, so we get the field graph over here. So, so what's the time complexity in this Gaussian relation process? So that will be um, the complexity, uh, the sum of complexity uh, or, or steps. So for each step, we want to make a click uh, we want to, like, we want to, uh, basically we need to calculate a shear complement of this matrix and that takes uh, square, uh, that, takes, that takes time that's uh, the square of the, the, the degree of this node. And this, this degree is called the field degree. So in order to find the optimal ordering, um, people made lots of attempts. However, we have a negative result. Uh, finding the optimal ordering is a bit hard. And, but we have a good news. Um, a very simple, uh, straightforward uh, heuristic called mean degree ordering can actually give us a very good performance. And the mean degree ordering is just to, uh, is, is just the ordering uh, obtained by pivoting the mean degree vertex at every single step. Uh, so in applications, we know mean degree ordering can give us a, a huge cash bonus by uh, doing this in pre-processing, uh, uh, by doing pre-processing. Because if we know which node we are going to pivot in the Gaussian emulation, we can just rearrange the matrix in a correct order. So during the Gaussian emulation, we don't need to rearrange the row and column to make, uh, to do a Gaussian uh, to do the Gaussian simulation. So it's like we can use, get a, a huge cash bonus by doing so. And this is also a very famous heuristic that's uh, used in like MATLAB and Julia. So question, when you do the mean ordering, is it by the minimum current degree? Current uh, yeah, minimum current degree. So you can't necessarily like pre-process the whole thing in advance and know like the uh, no, we, 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 we know we can so this is already by like every single step, yeah. I just like find a node with minimum degree, yeah. and when I feel with it, and I, I just read it, uh, pick, uh, find, find the next minimum degree vertex, so we get this order. Uh, so you were asking whether we can find the order to minimize the, the total cost of the whole thing, and that's a bit harder. I'm just saying, like, it, it, it seemed like from that like bullet point that says pre-processing that like maybe you could figure out like the order you're gonna do yeah. like right at the very beginning and then go in that order. Um, you can just Definitely. you can do symbolic pre-processing. He's saying yes. yes. The answer is yes. To yeah, question. that's yeah. exactly what the talks about. Yeah. So it's it's like you you so since we we, we can we can know this sequence ahead, so we can we can just rearrange the matrix in the correct way based okay. on these meaning. But it's a non-trivial claim, I guess the point is. Like you're claiming that you're going to show us why you can find this ordering ahead of time. It's not supposed to be obvious why you can't. Uh, this talk is about how to find okay. this mean degree order okay. efficiently. Okay. Because once we have this mean degree ordering, the Gaussian, we can have some cash bonus in Gaussian okay. Okay. So, So the ordering it just knows, a, only has to know which are non-zero. It doesn't have to know the values in the matrix. It just uh, has to know which ones are non-zero. Yes. Yes. So in other words, you get a binary matrix. Uh -huh. That's the input to the problem you're solving, and then you're going to output the ordering. Yeah, that is, that's exactly what. And then later on, you're going to actually compute the. Yeah, we're, we're, we're actually going to compute what the exact value they, value later on in the Gaussian information process, and we can assume no cancellation, and because cancellation can only make uh, the time capacity lower. Okay, so, so the question is how to find this mean degree ordering efficiency. So we have, um, so we have no result, uh, the no result that the following. So uh, we know the naive result is n squared time. Uh, so it's like we basically just simulate, uh, simulate this Gaussian animation process and then every single step is like we find the we we'll, we'll find the minimum node and we'll pivot it. 
and that takes n, n cube time and n squared space. And so that's another MMD algorithm that takes n squared time n squared times m time using only m space. So our first result is exact uh, exact mean degree orange. Um, so we can compute that uh, with high probability in O tilde m times delta time, where delta is the maximum degree pivoting. So uh, in the practice, delta can be very small. Question, did you say what MMD is? Uh, this is uh, a previous algorithm for calculating exact uh, mean degree orange. Are you guys a name or something? The name, okay. yeah. Uh, so in the practice, the delta can be very small because the graph can be very sparse, and like, and then it turns out the the, the maximum degree pivoting can be very small, like constant. So this is uh, actually a very good time we are getting. And our main result is this axial uh, approximate greedy mean degree uh, algorithm, and it runs in time O tilde m times epsilon to the minus two time. And then, um, so epsilon approximation here means that we, every single step, we just pivot the node with a degree that's upper bounded by one plus epsilon times the mean degree at a, at a step. So this is the mean degree at a step. So it's possible that like at a step, we, we have the mean degree is very huge, but it's, it's fine. We're going to find the node with the degree at that moment upper bounded by one plus epsilon times the degree. Okay, so um, before we talk about the detail, we we need to talk about the implicit representation of the field. So so one problem with the the field graph is that we it's possible that the we need to have lots of space to maintain the field graph. Consider a graph, a star graph. So we have a node connecting all other all other nodes. And then, in one step, we just want to pivot the center node of the center ver vertex of this star graph. So we know once we pivot this node, we're going to make a click out of its neighbors. So the result will be a complete graph with n minus one node, right? So that will be pretty bad because we basically need to store uh, n squared um, information. So that's pretty bad. So that's why people propose the implicit representation of this real graph. Um, so the idea is very simple. So at the beginning, we just mark every node in green. And whenever we want to pivot a node, U, we mark this U in color red. And then we don't do anything else. So in a, in a field graph, we claim um, UV is the edge in the field graph. When there is a path from U to V, there are only red vertices. So here is the, uh, is the example. So we have a graph over here. We, we have already pivoted uh, X, Y, and Z. And then instead of making a click out of their neighbors, we are going to just mark them in red. So in this case, we can easy, it's easy to check. U and V is actually an edge in the field graph because there's a path from U to V via Y and Z. And furthermore, we're going to uh, make the representation even simpler. We propose a component graph. So it's very simple. We just contract all the connected red vertices in this uh, implicit representation. So we have, so in this case, we can contract Y and Z into C2. Uh, which means, uh, which represents the connected component of this Y and Z. So in this case, uh, U and V is in the field graph because U and V share um, a common red vertex. So, and, it, and now we can easily, <coughs> we can, we can, it's very easy to check whether U and V are in the field graph. We just need to see whether they are shared by a set uh, red vertex. This graph you're starting with is the initial field graph, or what's the? Uh, this is this is not the initial field graph. This uh, this graph. Oh uh, yes, this graph is done by the initial field graph. So we have the initial field graph, 
So whenever we want to pivot the node, when we don't make a new build map, we just change the color of the node. And then we contract the, 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 but the you need to, you need to compute the degree to decide the yeah, that's, next one. Yeah, that's, uh, that's basically we need to figure out using this representation okay. to compute the main degree order. I'm sure I'm really confused, but I'm having trouble seeing the first claim that like uh, it's equivalent to be, for the edge to be in the fill graph, it would be this pass through. Like, can I have this some situation where I pass through a red vertex to another main vertex mm -hmm. and then do that again? Yeah, so, so, <coughs> so in, 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 the, in the first graph, so say we pivot oh, no, I see, never mind. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. So it's like, since you want to yeah, like, yeah, yeah. connect all your neighbors, so yeah. eventually you can connect yeah. all green. <laughs> okay, um, so in order to solve this problem, we uh, solve the mean degree ordering problem, we propose um, an improvement problem. So this problem has nothing to do with the graph. It's a very simple problem where we have n, uh, n subset S1 to Sn, and then we define reachable set SSI to be the union of the sets with the indices in Si. So, uh, so it's like, uh, say we want, we want to know the, the reachable set of S1, we just like check every single element in S1, say like they are like 3, 5, and 7, and then the reachable set of S uh, of S1 is just the union of S3, S5, and S7. Okay, uh, and then we are asked to design a data structure that supports four, four and three operations. Uh, the first one is to remove element E from SI, and the second one is to melt SI into SJ. That means we want to replace SJ by the union of SI and SJ. And the third operation is to query the mean of the size of all <coughs> reachable sets. So why this random question is equivalent to the question of finding mean degree ordering? So we can actually, it's actually very easy to see. We can simply define SI to be the neighbor <coughs> set of vertex i. So in this case, um, we just need to consider the component graph. Uh, and, and then in order to find the main degree vertex, we just need to query the mean of the size of reachable set. Because, uh, so, so, so one question, what's the reachable set in, uh, in SI in this graph? Say i is v. So, so the reachable set of v is just the union of C1 and C2. And which turns out to be all the nodes, all the vertices that V can reach via at most one red vertex. So, and we can also check all other um, operations over here. They are all associated with the pivot operation um, in the mean degree ordering problem. Okay, so for, for now, uh, question? Yeah, so do you start off with putting like red components on the at all the edges of the graph? Uh, actually, the, the initialization uh, setup is a, a little bit complicated. It's like we somehow need to like duplicate uh, some nodes like into because it's possible that we will have like edge from green to green, right? So that will cause some like bubble. So it's like um, yeah, the question is yes. So yeah. So but it's when like same works, right? <laughs> I think he's just proposing a nice way to admit it, and that is to put a, a red node in the middle of each edge, yeah. and then there's never any green, green edges left. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's all he said. Cool. So do you have a SI for every red one or every node? Only for red nodes or all for uh, red nodes? For all of them. <coughs> a red, one for every red node and one for every edge. Every green, green edge. So it's like, the, so the, in this graph, it's like for every red vertex, you <coughs> maintain all your green neighbors, right? So for all, all, all your green neighbor, you will maintain all your red neighbors, right? So, so in order, the neighbors of the green vertices will also have green vertices. Yeah. So 
That's, yeah, that's why you insert the red vertices on each edge. Oh, okay. so that's what it says by vertices. And the red vertices will only have green. Yes, okay. the red will only have green, but the green may have uh, green as well. But this is just some uh, <coughs> method. Uh, what it's just some detail. We can just focus on uh, on this this set bubble. So it's like so. And step, we, let's just focus on this uh, equivalent problem. We can just forget about the main degree problem. Question? The number of subsets will always be the same as the number of like, integers? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. 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 Yes, because in, in this case, n is the number of vertices you yes. graph. So, so it's like you. Well, I just like in the melding step, right? Like you get rid of the one of the subsets, but like the ground step stays one through n seemingly. So then you have like fewer subsets then. Yeah, eventually you will have at the end of the day you will you will have only one set. Because okay. because eventually you will pivot everything to one. Okay. Right. Okay, um, since we are not going to talk about uh, calculating mean theory, let's just change the title of this talk. Uh, the new title is 101 ways to estimate the size of the set in a changing world. Okay, so uh, let's just review this different problem. This is a problem we are going to focus on in a later talk. So it's like we have n subset, and then we have three operations. We can remove element from one operation. Uh, we remove element from one set, and we can melt one set into the other set, and we, we, we are going to query the minimum reachable set. Reachable set is defined by the union of the sets with the indices uh, in, at, in this set. Okay, so first of all, we want to simplify this problem. Instead of considering a changing world, we are going to consider a static world. So why not going to consider those messy operations? We just need to consider one operation. We just need to know the, the size of a reachable set. Okay, just this just focus on this very simple problem. And we have three solutions um, we are going to talk about. So the first one is L0 sketch and coupon factor, and the third one is local sampling. Okay, um, so so the first one is static L0 sketch. Uh, this is the idea from Cohen, uh, 1997. So he asked a question. Michael wasn't even born by that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Who was it? Uh, this is the other Cohen. So, um, so, he, this call has asked a question. Can we measure the size of a, a subset P with an in ID random variable distributed uh, from <coughs> 0 to 1? So say we have an ID random variable P1 to Pn. Can we measure the size of P? So the answer is yes. Um, the idea is that we can report the minimum p value in this set t. So we have a, a calculation over here that as the tech, uh, expected value of this mean value, um, it will be the inverse of the size of t plus one. Okay, um, let's do a quick test. So we want to know how many people are there in this room. So I have an idea. Uh, so we can use the minimum last four digits for number. So just tell me your last four digits of four number if you think you, this number is small. Um, this is this. Who starts with zero? Is this your phone number or your social security number? Uh, uh, it's, I, I think phone number is better. <laughs> okay, tell me your minimum phone number uh, if you think your number is small. What, what's yours? 0844. 0844. Anyone has? Anyone beat that? What? 0777. Zero, zero, seven, seven. Okay. Anyone beat that? Going. Going. <laughs> okay. So this is the minimum number. So 
So this is the number of of people in this room. It will be ten thousand over seven hundred and seventy-seven. So what's that? Uh, this number is roughly like fourteen, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like thirteen people. Uh, so, <laughs> so this is wrong. <laughs> Yeah, so this is the first issue we just talked about. So the phone number is not evenly distributed. So it's like some commercial number has have like lots of zeros. So so this is the issue one. And the other issue is that this is just one evaluation evaluation of this uh, mean value. We need lots of them to get the concentration. So by channel of one, we need to have um, epsilon to the minus two samples to get at least concentration. Well, yeah. has three for you. Wow. <laughs> he has three samples. He has three problems, he said. So, <laughs> so that, that would be the measurement for the number of phones in this room. <laughs> Everybody has three phones. Everybody has three phone numbers, so we have three independent samples. Uh, yep, that, that's a good idea. Okay, um, so, so now um, we, we, we want to answer the query of the size of this ritual set SSI. So we just use this method. So we know mean operation is transitive. So, so in order to calculate the mean value that you can, that you have in your ritual set, you just need to calculate the mean value of every single set, and then you just calculate the mean value uh, uh, associated with this set SI. So, uh, because mean is transitive, so we can just ver uh, get this mean value very fast. Okay, uh, so this is the second, the second uh, <coughs> estimator, called coupon collection estimator. So, coupon collector problem is a very famous problem. So, say we want to collect n coupons, uh, at least once. Uh, and then, uh, how many samples do we need to, to, to get each coupon at least once? So the answer is n log n, which just means we have n log n samples. So every time you just uniformly take a coupon, and n log n coupons guarantee um, covering the whole set. So, so, and, so the question now is, how can we get this uniform sector for reachable set SSI? So that will be the question because it's not clear how you, how you can do that because like you may have like two sets with some overlapping. Like how can you sample a, a node in this reachable set like without over like counting a number in the inter intersection? So there there will be lots of messy issues coming out. So the idea is very simple. We just use the same, um, the same <coughs> ID um, random variables we used in the last slide. And then we just need to maintain a hash table that can reverse the real number to the integer number who generates this real number. So, uh, so in this case, we just like, we, we still sample uh, an ID random variable from zero to one and then I claim P inverse, the mean value of, of uh, P SSI is gonna be uniformly sampled from this ritual set of I. Because every element will have the same chance <coughs> to become the minimum element in the ritual set. So, so P inverse here is a notation. Uh, it's just like if you, I give you a real number, I, I can, um, it tells me um, which i gives us this uh, p value. Okay, um, so, and then by having delta log delta samples, we can get the exact size of, uh, of this reachable set. So delta here, assuming uh, somehow we know the upper bound of uh, the, the size of reachable. 
So that will be our second estimator. <coughs> okay. Uh, the third estimator is one of our results, uh, one of our small results. So we can as also estimate the, the size of reachable set in only um, old filter the size of this set times epsilon 2 uh, minus 2 time. So the idea is um, is it is following. So it's like in order to measure uh, the size of this uh, reachable set, we can um, think of this problem as measuring uh, the number of non-zeros in a matrix. Um, yeah, actually, I didn't write these <coughs> things on this slide. So it's like, because here we want to we have a zero one matrix, and then we want to measure how many non-zero um, columns we have in this matrix. I think it's rows in this case, isn't it? Because uh, your set's your problem, right? Yeah, the set is called, yeah. So it's like, in this case, like we, we say we want to query SS2 over here. So we want to, we want to know how many rows um, this, so by using column one, two, and five, how many rows, uh, how many non-zero rows can we have in this matrix? So this is, this is one way to think of this problem, right? So it's like, if we want to query uh, SSI, we can, we can basically write a matrix with, uh, in this way, like the color is the set, and the rows are elements. If, if set I contains element J, we have a, a, a one in I column and J row, right? So every time we want, want to query the size of the reachable set for one set SI, we just need to consider how many non-zero rows we have by using those columns. Okay, so just so I understand uh, the point. So like, we're trying to estimate the size of S of SI, mm -hmm. and so is the point that you want some method which does this, whose complexity just is like roughly like the size of SI? Yes. That's the point? <laughs> yeah, that's the point. Okay. So, so in, order, in order to do that, we can do the sampling in this way. So first of all, we want to sample a non-zero entry uniformly. So by, by using the first line and the second line, we can do that. Because like we know the size of every individual set as j, right? So we can just pick a j proportional to the size of s j. And then we uniformly pick an element as j. So the effect of these two, uh, if these two commands would be sampling a non-zero entry uniformly in this matrix, okay? And then we 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 want to measure how many sets will, will contain this entry. So in in order to do that, we use uh, the third uh, we, we run the third line. So we uniformly sample the index A, A1, A2 to AT until this sampled element E is contained in this set SAT. So in this example, if we want to measure the reachable set of SS2, first of all, we uniformly sample a 1, which is marked red in this matrix. And then, say we sample over, we get this 1 over here. And then we uniformly, uh, we try to, we try to uh, throw some dart in this row until we we find the, until we find the, uh, we hit this one, find the, find the one in this case. And then we can use the number of dots we throw to estimate how many sets will cover this, how many sample of sets do we need to cover this one. And then. Um, the claim is using this number, we can get the estimator of the size of reachable set. So I'm just wondering the third step. So you sample the sets mm -hmm. that are in SI or from the entire universe of sets? Uh, in, from N. 
Well, this is an integer. We sample an integer. Like random integer between one and n, right? Always between one and n. Okay, so yeah. let's say you know I have like set s one only contains an element one, and nothing else contains an element one. Right? Yeah, it will take lots of a long time to find the element that, that contains this. So oh, this but is the estimator a, is good. Yeah. Uh, so but yeah. it's like but if, if so so but so why is the time then that small? Why is the time small then? Sorry. Uh, because like we. Although in this case, we will take a long time to get this, uh, but like this actually contributes a lot to our final estimator because eventually we want to use a uh, channel bar. So it's like, so we know the channel bar is like, so what, what aspect of channel bar is the summation of the, the, the value, the sample value, right? So that would be the, the term in, in the e to the minus, the, the summation of the value, uh, right, so it's like, I'm missing something, so in this case, you know, uh -huh. SI is one, this is the entire thing that I want to estimate, I want the answer one out, right, uh, I feel like it's going to take, I mean, are you amortizing over multiple queries, I'm not No, no, this is just for one thing, simple estimation. So, you know, just, I just want to have S1, there is one element, it's going to reference itself, like, it's really, like, the answer is one. Yeah. And I feel like it's going to take at least 10 time until I get it down, right? Uh, no, no. Long. So in this case, it's like, so oh, you, you're saying you, you, you have like S1 and have 1 in yeah. the first entry? S1 is 1, only has an element 1 here, so the answer is 1. Uh, so in, this makes sense, sorry. Yeah, uh, wait, wait. Hold on. Um. So what's A to T? So, yeah, maybe so you're so sampling the sets from, you know, the, the, from the, yeah, from the ones that have been assigned, right? So, so we, we uniformly, so first step, we want uniformly sample of a one. Yeah, the Sure, and then you hit the square in the same row. Okay, maybe it sounds simple. We can believe the result. Trying to, oh, we're trying to query SI2? What's, what's the answer? So you are saying um, S1 is... S1 is 1, and then you just... Uh, this element 
exclude? The answer is none, right? Except for S2. No, so... We don't care about S4, right? Because it has nothing to do with it. Yeah, we don't... I mean, presumably this method should not actually run. So in this case, so it's like we, 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 we also need to like withstand a long time to figure out actually, uh, like there's only one that contains this element three, right? So that's five. So it's like in this step, if for example, this one, we need to have, we need to like, like take another five times, uh, five hits to hit the same one again, uh, right? I, I think what's going on with the algorithm is in the third step when we're sampling, we should be sampling from uh, the sets, we should be sampling from S1, S3, S5, not all the sets, just the sets that are neighbors of S2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You pick S1 with frequency two, S3 with frequency two, and S5 with frequency two. Changing world. Um, so, so remember, we just simplified the problem to the case where we only have one query, right? We just query the size of reachable set. Okay. So, so and, and now we want to consider the changing world where we 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 need to support dynamic operation, and then we need to query. Um, we also need to query the main, which is the hardest operation uh, in this problem. So, so let's do some. Quick summary of these three S measure we had, like so for the edge update, like so the um, actually this is a summary for the latest slide. It's like we, we uh, so the conclusion is the coupon collector is good at um, good at funding the global mean under the update um, and potential rebuilding randomness. Uh, let's go back to this slide later, and we'll, we'll talk about the, the original problem. So the original problem, we need to support three uh, operations. They are uh, removing element E from SI, and melding SI into SJ, and query the mean value, mean, uh, mean, uh, the, the, the <coughs> mean uh, size of the original set. So, um, so in this case, we are going to facing two types of adversaries. So the first type of adversary is the, uh, the oblivious adversary, which means um, those operations uh, given by adversary are given before the whole thing happens. So in this case, the adversary will specify um, all the set over here, and they will just give you a sequence of operation, and then you run the algorithm to uh, to answer those questions. So in this case, um, so in this case, we can we can just adapt this uh, L zero sketch we had uh, into a dynamic uh, manner. So uh, so the idea is very simple. Initially, we just uh, sample uh, the the P. We just Copy, uh, sample P 
for k times will specify k later on, and then uh, for each um, each p, we just like have a, a an array storing data for it, and then and then we have another layer that contains the the main value of each p value for each set, <coughs> and then in the next layer we can uh, have the main value among all the main value in previous layer associated with each set, and then we have k copy of them. Uh, so, so this is k, sorry. So we'll have k copy of them, and using the concentration result, we can just use the average to measure <coughs> the size of the reachable set. So, so this is the, the whole L0 sketch data structure over here. So, the, so now uh, here comes the question. So we want to update um, this data structure uh, under two operations. One is like removing an element from a set. So in this case, we use the eager strategy. So we uh, say we want to remove element two for set S1. So in this case, we, we just eagerly update the main value uh, over here. We say we want to we remove F, a P2 from S1. So we just eagerly update the value over here. So what I mean by equally recalculate the mean value is that we, if the, this value turns out to be the mean value over here, we need to recalculate this mean value, right? But since we have, um, since the, uh, we, uh, the adversary was choosing the sequence of operation before everything happens, so we have independency uh, in this case, so we, we can say with only one over the size of S1 chance, uh, we need to recalculate the mean value of PS1 over here. So, so in expectation, it only takes constant, constant time to do this eager up update. And then, uh, similarly, we can also um, calculate the expected cost for melding two set. Uh, so the cut, say we want to melt set S1 into S2. So with this uh, probability, we need to update every single element uh, in S1. So because the mean value can only be, um, like can only, uh, the mean value will be like, so with this much of chance, the mean value will be in, in S2. So in this case, we need to update all the mean, the, the, the value in S1. So we need to go through every element that S1 can reach. Uh, so this is the expected cost for this case, and the other case is uh, the second component. And do some MLA. Um, so we can calculate the <coughs> amortized running time uh, under the the operation over here, so eventually we can get a linear result um, for a previous adversary. Okay, uh, so here comes the, the question. So why do we care the the difference between the adaptive and the oblivious adversary? So here is the example. So consider uh, we want to measure the size of the blue circle over here, the blue set over here, by sampling um, a random, a uniform sample, a small set of uh, uh, elements. Uh, so we, we call this set red set. So, so one way to measure the size of this blue set is to use the intersection between red and blue times the size of uh, the number of all elements over the size of sam sample elements in red. Right? So this is a very simple estimation. So in order to best estimate a bigger size uh, set, we just need to sample several elements in red, and we see how many elements do we have in, in blue. And then based on this ratio, we can calculate the size of blue. So. 
So this is what adaptive adversary can do. So in order to query this blue set, um, so he's gonna mess up this estimation in following way. So first of all, he's gonna query the size of this uh, blue set, and then he just randomly remove the element in it. And then he query the size of this, uh, this blue set, uh, except this random element, and test whether uh, the size remain unchanged. So in this case, he will know whether this element is in this secret red set. So if this happens, he will pull this element back <coughs> and repeat this process. So um, under these operations, this adaptive adversary can eventually remove all the elements um, that are not in this red set. So eventually, so this, uh, this adversary can get the whole red set. And then the, at the end of the day, it's like the estimation will be way off because uh, if we take the formula, uh, take the, the red set into this formula, we get a result which is the number of every elements, the number of all elements, right? So there will, there will be a pretty bad estimation. So and so when you think about uh, the way to handle this adaptive adversary, so one way to handle this adaptive adversary is to use determinism. So consider this uh, uh, mean degree mean degree ordering adversary. So the mean ordering adversary is just what we need to do to solve mean degree ordering problem. So every time you just query uh, the, the the mean reachable set, and then it just <coughs> does some operation based on the based on the this, the result he get for the query, and then repeat this process. Okay. So one way to solve to get rid of the dependency issue is to force uh, the result to be the grand true. So, uh, what I mean is that if we can have an algorithm guarantee that with high probability, every, uh, every single step of the query, we can get the precise uh, minimum uh, reachable set. And then we just do operation based on this set. And then in this case, it, this decision making has nothing to do with the randomness we were using to calculate this minimal reachable uh, set. So in this case, if we need to, in order to guarantee a uh, high probability result, we need to have this error absolute to be at very, very small, say less than one over n. So in that case, L0 sketch would take time m times n squared. So that's pretty bad. That's the same result people were giving in the past. However, we can use the, the coupon pleasure estimator. And given that the coupon pleasure estimator doesn't need to have that many copier, that many samples to make a concentration, you only require uh, delta log delta uh, copies to guarantee uh, the high probability result for every. Um, reachable set. So the overall cost of this Kubot collector estimator will be <coughs> n times delta. And this is the exact minimum result <coughs> we are getting. Okay, and now let's consider the approximate result. So um, so one so we have a, a stupid idea. So we have a, a local estimator we just described um, in the previous slide. So this local estimator uses internal randomness. It doesn't repeatedly use the same randomness seed to calculate the, to estimate the size of reachable set. Every time it just like throw the dot into the rows until it hits the one again. So that's the randomness it's having. Um, so we can just a stupid idea is that every single time whenever well, we need to answer the minimum size of reachable set, we just measure the, the reachable set of any i, and then we just take the minimum of them. So recall that it takes, um, basically it takes uh, tilde, um, 
the size of <coughs> si time. So the whole thing would take um, uh, m time for each query. So it's also going to be pretty expensive. So, but here is the question. Do we really need to enumerate all i's in order to find the, the minimal local estimate, uh, local estimate i? So um, the answer is yes and no. So, so, so one idea is that we can, um, if, if somehow this epsilon approximate L0 sketch can tell us, um, can, um, so, so it's like if, if it can tell us one, one reachable set has size that's way more than the minimal of the reachable sets E estimates, then we can basically ignore this SI because it's not going to happen even though we, we want to. So this set is not going to be, become the minimal reachable set under the local estimate because like, this, the, the size is just too different. Even, even though like, we may have some error in the, the L0 sketch, but like, there's no way this, this set would become the minimal set in the local estimate. So we can just let L0 sketch to pick some candidates, and then we just test them via local estimator. However, um, some bad things will happen. What if all I will have the same size of reachable set? So in that case, this L0 sketch cannot tell the difference between anyone, <laughs> and then it will just pick all sets as the candidate set. So that would be pretty bad. However, what if that didn't happen? So, so this is a trick to prevent uh, what I just described uh, from happening. So in, instead of calculating the grand truth, uh, the, the real minimum uh, reachable set, we add <coughs> an epsilon decay to the reachable set at every single step. So the idea is that every single step, we just saw a, a coin for every, uh, every reachable set i, and then we just use that uh, 1 minus delta i decay um, to, to evaluate its, uh, its size. So instead of using its own reachable uh, set size, we want to add a tiny noise to this number. And then, uh, if the, we can guarantee that this arrow is not going to be too big, we can still guarantee axial approximation. So, so now the, the, the question is, how many decayed candidates do we need um, to find such uh, a, a real minimum uh, reachable set? So that's a, that's a result from the exponential distribution, we know if we want to perturb every element by an uh, independent exponential uh, random variable, and then only constant, constant of them are within uh, one plus over axiom of the minimum. So using this result, we can use L0 sketch to store all the elements in buckets, and then say the bucket i will have all the reachable set of size uh, from 1 plus uh, epsilon to the j to the 1 plus epsilon to the j plus 1. So, and then we can just pick uh, candidates from each bucket uh, uniformly plus some random decay based on all the statistics. So it's like, so we can set this epsilon hat to be very, very small. So in each bucket, we can assume all the reachable sets have the same size, but the difference is that some of them will, be, will have the chance to become the candidate. So those candidates um, are the sets that, that obtain a very small, a uh, very large noise downtick. So what I mean is like, so it's like, um, so we have uh, these buckets that we have like 100, 100, uh, <coughs> reachable set. They are basically have 
of the same site, and then we'll add the, this uh, exponential display to each element. So this, the effect of adding this decay, uh, exponential decay is basically that uh, we just like pick some of them and, and then we somehow uh, add up the, this decay <laughs> to each one of them and we use the, this decay to, uh, to estimate the uh, decay value. I think so at a high level, so, so the actual ordering you're going to return is going to be dependent on the exponent, the variables, the exponential decay variables, or not? Uh, it's going to depend on this exponential. So that's going to be a critical thing, right? And so sometimes but this is special uh, shift. It does not make the L1 independent. So this helps you keep the L1, uh, the L0 sketch independent? Yeah, the, uh, the, the reason this keeps L0 sketch independent is that we we make this decision not based on this decay, but based on the double check of the local estimator after this candidate selection. So in this candidate selection, we're, we're just going to like decay every element by, by something, and then we'll pick some candidate. And then we, eventually, we're not going to pick the, the element um, based on the value we estimated over here. We want to double check the, the value by the local estimator we just described before. Because the decision making is really from the local estimator instead of the L0 sketch. So the decision making is being independent from the random seeds we are using for L0 sketch. So the other way to think of this problem is that we, we can just consider a crazy problem. We just like basically evaluate every element using local estimator plus the decay. Okay, so this is definitely a, a, a very good algorithm. It has no dependency issue, right? So the problem is we can't go through every single element one by one and check uh, and, and calculate their local estimator value. So this is very expensive. So this is why we have L0 sketch here to help us to uh, select a candidate ahead of time. And then this local estimator only need to check those candidates. So as long as we can guarantee that among those candidates with high probability, the, really, the real minimum uh, reachable set is selected and then this local estimator will eventually pick that real uh, decayed uh, as, uh, reachable set as the, the decision. So in, 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 in that case, the decision making has nothing to do with the randomness in L0 sketch. So and then they can, we can just get rid of the dependency issues. Okay, uh, thanks.